welcome to yet another edition of the A to Z Sports Big Orange Podcast. I am Charlie Burris. Here, as always, with my co-host and A to Z Sports Tennessee writer, Zach Reagan. Wherever you listen throughout the world, we thank you so much for listening to our little show here. We talk everything balls every week on the Big Orange Podcast. If that sounds like something you want to listen to regularly, go to the A to Z Sports Podcast Network feed. Apple, Spotify, and subscribe. If you subscribe, you won't miss an episode when we drop them on Mondays, except this one is on Tuesdays. I'll, Tuesday, I'll explain why in just a second. At Charlie underscore Burris, at Zach TNT, at A to Z Sports on Twitter, at A to Z Sports on Instagram, Facebook.com slash A to Z Sports Nashville, and A to Z Sports.com for everything that Zach and I write. So as I said, apologies for the one-day delay on this episode. We usually drop on Mondays. But uh, Zach and I both, in a completely unplanned way, were both in New York City over the weekend. Uh, I was there for anniversary for me and my wife. Uh, Zach was there being easily one of the coolest dads in the world, taking his kid to a Mets game, which is so sick. Um, and so that's where we were. It didn't get back till yesterday uh, at midnight. And so now my blood is caffeine and we're here. What's up, Zach? Uh, there was a fun trip and completely random that we were both there at the same time. And I tweeted about this this morning. We were at the Mets game on Sunday. We went to uh Saturday and Sunday's game. A great time. Mets lost Saturday, won Sunday. So, so left on a good note there. But as I was uh, crossing through a row to get to my seats on uh, Sunday before the game started, I had to scoot by a gentleman, and I looked down and realized he had a Tennessee Vols hat on. And I hit him with a quick go Vols. He hit me back with it. So it's very true. Tennessee fans are everywhere. It seems like every event, sporting event, concert, whatever I go to, you always see at least, no matter where you're at, you see at least one Tennessee hat, shirt, something. It never, ever fails. So I was glad it, it rained true, even in New York City. Always. That that really is crazy. Um, so there's that, the, the reason for the delay. But we are going to talk Tennessee sports, as we always do. And we got to start off. Tennessee baseball finally has been knocked off of, well, not, this is, that's over dramatic, I guess. They lost. They finally lost. (laughs) They won so much for so long that they're still number one. Yeah, we almost, it almost felt like they were undefeated, right? Even though they had already lost earlier in the season, but they had, they won like 23, 24 games in a row, something like that. I think it was 23 and then the 24th game is what they lost. If I'm thinking correctly, it was a wooden bats game against Tennessee tech and Tennessee tech put this kid out there who was throwing in the dirt at like 70 miles an hour. And it just threw Tennessee through a loop for, for whatever reason. Thankfully by the weekend, they got their mojo back uh, pretty completely, but they went first day of the weekend lose to Alabama, and we'll get into a little bit more of the detail of that game in a second, but then they follow that up with two two dominant wins in the next two days, and uh, Ortega came up huge They and really got that offense going, and then they just drilled them. I mean, that second game was 15-3 to three or something, just murdered them in that uh, final game on Sunday, but the story of the weekend was really this. Tony Vitello the coach of our great Tennessee baseball team got ejected from the first game and right at the beginning of the game. And I, I wasn't watching again. It was on an anniversary trip with, with uh, the wife. I was not watching at the time have since seen the clips and everything that happened. Um, But first Frank Anderson gets tossed. Who was the pitching coach? If you don't know but and, Excellent, excellent coach. And one of the main reasons why Tennessee is so great right now. He does such a good job with those pitchers. But Chase Chase Dolander gets nailed with a line drive. And th- thankfully, the report, I actually have it up here. And just uh, we don't have to go into this, really. But uh, he avoided a right arm fracture when struck by a line drive. Uh, I think his return is kind of in, indeterminate. But the belief is that Blade 
Tidwell will start in his spot this weekend. We'll see how that goes. Um, but he gets nailed by a line drive. Dolander does. And then something ensues from there that gets Frank Anderson tossed. And then that pisses off Vitello. And Vitello goes out there. And in a move that I would say most of us want to see happen, but you also can't do, <laughs> he chest bumps the ump and you know obviously a meet it gets well i think he had actually already gotten ejected but was still just berating yeah the guy. yeah i think it was the reaction <laughs> to the ejection that uh yes. it was more of a waist bump it was more of his waist really yeah if you, if you look at it which is kind of hilarious but he he gives gives him the old the old chest bump and as i said you can't do that you got to keep your composure if you're Tony. But also, we all wanted to see Tony do that. Let's be honest. That ump was so out of line. That entire weekend, that ump was out of line. Just got absolutely annihilated online. Not just by Tennessee fans either, but supposedly, again, I was kind of in and, in and out of commission this entire weekend with the trip. But it, it seemed like his, his strike zone was all over the place. And that was really the point of contention originally, I believe, with Frank Anderson. Um, and, and I don't, I don't think he was. He was the home plate umpire on Friday night, whenever Tennessee played. So on Saturday, he was their bait. Yeah, he wasn't. And the the issue was balls and strikes, as best I can tell from Frank Anderson. That got him ejected, and that wasn't even the home plate umpire that was calling balls and strikes. He ejected him, and I think that's part of what why people were so incensed. I mean, like you said, non Tennessee fans were like this. This I think somebody said this clown is putting himself, you know, into the game, inserting himself, yeah. making himself like a part of the game when he, you know, that's not the goal of the umpire in any way. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess should have prefaced that, although I assume most people saw you. I was the third third base ump in that situation. And and so, yeah, the, I, I guess that was the whole thing. He tosses Anderson and then Vitello gets involved. How, however, when, again, I... What I've collected is from Twitter, from what I could surmise from everything that happened. I did not see it live. Uh, un unfortunately, I almost always do. But this is this really was it was the first game this entire season I haven't watched was this one. And all of this stuff goes down. Um, So from there, Tony goes buck wild, chest bumps the guy as as he should have. Honestly, screw that guy. Um. And he gets, I believe, a four-game suspension out of this. A four-game on top of already he had to sit out the rest of the weekend. Um, or was it, did the Sunday game... Yeah, I think the Sunday game started the suspension. Okay, the Sunday game counted, but he sat out Saturday in addition. So I guess like a five-game suspension in total. Essentially, essentially. Yeah, so theoretically would be back... This coming For the Sunday, final game of the Florida series, I would assume, yeah. because they got a midweek game going going to Gainesville um, this coming weekend. But a, a wild situation. But I still, I love how this. It just adds to the mythos of this whole team. This whole thing, the Vitello, is brash enough that he has that that fire to chest bump an umpire. <laughs> I love that so much. Like you, obviously we know Arkansas fans would they, if, if Dave Van Horn did this, they would, I don't, I don't know, go up to the top of the baseball stadium and jump off. Probably it would be too much for them to handle. I'm not sure. Cause they seem like, God forbid you do anything. If you look in the wrong direction, Arkansas fans will go, no, oh, you're disrespecting the game of baseball. How dare you? you this is a shame, a shame to the game. The, the game that Babe Ruth created or whatever they, they're, you know, good old boy network for some reason. They love that. Um, I think this is so great, honestly. Uh, you know, obviously, without Vitello, they still smashed Alabama. So I don't, they have a competent coaching staff all the way down. And I, you make it through this Florida series without him. I, <laughs> is, this, is this honestly like almost a net gain for Tennessee? It's just more exposure about this team. And adding to the whole thing, I guess the only thing I worry about: do does this get Vitello on the wrong side of SEC 
officiating in general. Um, because it's a pretty serious thing. Or is is he gonna suddenly be on a super short leash? I guess is is how it would put it. You, you gotta wonder if there's a little bit of retaliation there in, in solidarity with with their colleague. Uh do do other umpires give Tennessee a hard time now? I don't know. Uh, maybe I heard Vitello actually talk about this a little bit before any of this happened. He was on a, doing an interview with, uh, it might've been with Buck Rising. I think he did an interview on 104.5 The Zone a couple of weeks ago where he talked a little bit about you get fiery in the middle of a game, but you're in the moment, the umpire's in the moment. And after the game, you kind of acknowledge that it's nothing personal and you go on about your, your, your day. I think with this particular umpire that, everybody's kind of had issues with before it's a little bit of a different situation i'm guessing that's probably why vitello reacted the way that he reacted i mean i think i think tennessee's had some issues with him in the past other programs have as well so i think this situation it, maybe it's isolated in that way where this guy has a reputation i don't know how other umpires feel about him i don't know what kind of solidarity the sec umpires have with each other but I would kind of assume that it, it it's kind of an isolated incident. I, I think Vitello, as far as, yeah, if he does this again, if, if he how approaches an umpire, you know, maybe they'll be quicker to eject him. Obviously, he does it again. It's going to be a bigger suspension, maybe a fine. I don't know how all that will, will work with the SEC office. I don't think it's a huge deal. I mean, it's not like we've never seen this in baseball before. We've seen this plenty of times. It doesn't happen all the time on like a monthly basis. It it, it gets some attention when it happens. There's a suspension and people move on. I don't I don't foresee it being a huge deal. Yeah, hopefully not. Because this team obviously is just perpetually going to have this target on its back. When you are the number one team and everybody's dragging up the rear, You're that's who you are. You're the team that everybody wants to beat. You're going to kind of... As like Kentucky basketball fans love to say, we're everybody's Super Bowl. But really, I mean, when you're the number one team in America and Kentucky basketball certainly was never that this past season. Um, you know, when you are number one as Tennessee is at the moment, that's that's how it's going to be. So you have to contend with that. However, it comes. You would hope that SEC officiating has enough integrity to where that would not matter. But <laughs> uh, yeah, a yeah, fat chance of that happening. Uh I think we all know uh, how how Tennessee in general feels about SEC officiating. But um, there was one thing I saw on Twitter that was fantastic. I don't know who put it together, but they they played a video of Vitello bumping the umpire, but they played it in reverse, so it looked like the umpire was just causing all kinds of commotion and running up, and and he bumped Vitello. <laughs> <laughs> the caption said, "You be you be the judge of of who's to blame here," which is. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty funny because in the video, the umpire, his reaction is so dramatic. He kind of like acts like he's falling backwards and he's flailing his arms kind of everywhere, just incensed. And then he just walks away and lets the, the other umpires, I guess, handle the situation. But it was, it was like an NBA flop is what it reminded me of a little bit. Yeah. Unfortunately, you can't, uh, you can't call one on them in that case. It, again, it just adds to the the general nature of this team and how they are this i mean vi i mean villain is the right word right like you really are and they've embraced it they have and that's that's why you can't i don't think you're gonna find any tennessee fans getting up in arms about oh he, he bumped an umpire and yeah. <laughs> there, 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 there's a couple on facebook that were yeah well as you can imagine yeah, so just the, the the type that would go, oh, well, coach needs to keep his composure. We're, you know, so, okay, fine. We all know he went over the line. That's not the point. We all realize that. You can't I don't think anybody, nobody has an issue with the suspension. No, I haven't really not at seen all. That. I'm like, yeah, that's what happens. I mean, it would happen to any coach. Like, that's what yeah, they're going I, to do. I don't want him to go out and in the next game do it again. That's not <laughs> yeah. what I'm looking for. But it it is just this image that Tennessee has built of this juggernaut who's playing incredible uh, baseball. And then on top of that, when they beat you, they will get up in your face and say, what? What are you going to do about it? That's not our, my problem. Beat me if you don't want me to chirp at you or 
chest bump you or whatever, you know? Um, and so on, on that note, I, I loved this and I was listening to this this morning before we were recording this. Vitello went on actually before the Alabama series, before any of this ever happened, but after the loss to Tennessee tech, he went on, I guess, is it, is it barstool? I think they're yeah. barstool guys, uh, yeah. the bussin with the boys, which is Taylor Lewan of the, of my beloved Tennessee Titans and Will Compton, who has played for the Titans at some point. I don't know what he's doing now. Maybe just this podcast. I, not, I don't, I never know with that guy. It's like somebody signs yeah. him. He's released. He's back with the Titans. He's in Nashville. He's just, having a baby. I don't know. Just do the podcast. Yeah. Simplify <laughs> your life. Uh, but Vitello, I do, they, I do like, I do like Will Compton though. I should. It's, yeah, yeah. He's a fine guy. Went to, went to Nebraska. I don't have anything against him. It's not like he's like an Alabama guy or anything, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, Luan went to Michigan. If he didn't play for the Titans, I'd probably hate Luan. So I think you know. some Titans fans hate Luan. <laughs> but. Uh, I've had my qualms with him. I I can say <laughs> that much. He does he does a whole lot of talking, and you know, hasn't totally backed that up in the last couple of years. But uh, nonetheless, they came to Knoxville. Actually, they came to the football facility and did an interview. They they interviewed Heupel. They interviewed Eckler, Mike Eckler, because. Eckler coached Will Compton in college, so they brought him on the show, and they kind of did, you know, like a buddy buddy interview. Um, and I, for, I again, I assume most people know this. Eckler is the linebackers coach for Tennessee football, uh, and they interview him. Go listen to it; it's, it's good, good stuff. The hypo one hasn't come out yet, I don't think. But in this Fatello interview, they talk about how Tennessee has gotten this villain image. And Vitello just gives his straight up answer about what he thinks. I wish I could play this whole thing, but it's pretty profane. Uh, and so I don't, I, we try to keep this family friendly in a, in a general sense. Um, but this, I'll cut it off before it gets rough, but I will suggest if you are all right with listening to language, um, Go listen to it because the rest of his response is great too. And so here's here's a clip from uh, the the Bustin' with the Boys podcast, Lawan Compton talking about the the bad boy image of Tennessee baseball right now. Everybody's to school here, yeah, and everybody's been talking about a uh, Tennessee baseball. And I'm on my phone last night, late at night, scrolling, seeing all your guys' highlights and everything else. And Coach Eckler's giving me a background on you guys. You guys are kind of like the Detroit Pistons, the bad boys. <laughs> Of SEC baseball, college baseball, yeah, would you Raiders. Agree? Yeah, would you agree with that? Is that fair to say? Is that a good assessment? Uh, I mean, I kind of like that now at this age. I grew up. My old man's from Chicago, so I grew up a Bulls fan, and mm -hmm. I hated the Pistons. But I think if you're a competitor, that's kind of the way it should be. You should love the guy if he's on your team, or you should love your team if they're yours. And then you want to be hated if you know if you walk into an opponent's building, you don't want them to like you because that means they they're thinking easy victory. Yeah, yeah, but baseball in a lot of ways. Like and then it gets rough from there. But um, this, that's, he says it. He doesn't hide it. That's what he wants. And it's its not like, I think in, in past episodes we've talked about it, like he kind of lets his team be who they want to be. But the reason he does that is because he wants to be hated. I mean, he said it. <laughs> he literally said, if, you know, you want to love the guys that are on your team and then you want to be hated because if they don't hate you, they can easily beat you almost almost always. That's what that means. I truly, I could not love this more. I'm so happy this man is the Tennessee baseball coach. Yeah. I mean, he's he's leaned all the way into it. The players have. I I love it. And I mean, opposing SEC fans have got to the point where they they can't stand Tennessee. But then you're also seeing I've seen Ole Miss fans. I've I've written about it earlier this spring. I'm still seeing the comments. I saw one the other day from an old Miss fan on Twitter that uh, he said he'd walk on broken glass to Knoxville to have Tony Vitello as his coach. I mean, people hate him, but they want him as their coach. And then you see all these people nationally that are, you know, football players, like Taylor Luan tweeting about Tennessee baseball all the time. I saw Robert Griffin, you know, former uh, Baylor quarterback, NFL quarterback tweeting about Trey Lipstrom and, and his bat flip the other night. It's just amazing from a national perspective how many people are paying attention to Tennessee baseball, not just because of their good, not just because they're good, but because of how they're 
playing the game. I mean, the the entertainment value of it, uh, it's it's amazing. Getting a phone call over here. You probably, I don't know if you can hear that. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I hear something there. Yeah. Um, yes. The, it, it really is almost brand building. It is, I mean, it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. For it's, the whole program. Yes, it is. And, and really, I think college baseball in a macro sense has to be really happy about this because it's getting random people who would never watch college baseball to be watching college baseball. It's an entertaining product. I, I will say, I personally, I'm a big Rangers fan. Grew up going to, to Rangers games. My cousins live right by the stadium down there. Um, and like, so I, that's my, my exposure to baseball. They're really good when I was a kid, went to World Series, blah, blah. But they've stunk in the last few years. And I, the, the games are hard to come by. And it's the same with college baseball in that sense. The games are kind of hard to find on, on TV. They just, they just don't show that many of them. And, and the product can be really boring. It just can be. It's kind of a passive, is that the right word? A passive game? Like, uh, it just is a isn't slow as, game. It's, it's yes. slow. It, it's a, it's a completely different pace than than football or basketball it has these great exactly. moments but it, there might be 20 minutes of just nothing or yeah, longer and, you know and i will go i will go out of my way to watch a college football game i will go out of my way to watch an nfl game a college basketball game an nba game where it's just i'll i'll watch less last night flying back i just watched the golden state uh, in in their playoff game because it was just uber entertaining. With baseball, in large part, I just don't really do that. I don't. I'm not like, oh, I'm gonna go watch the Blue Jays and the Orioles play. Like, I don't. Nobody else just, is watching the Blue Jays and the Orioles either. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there. exactly. It just yeah, hasn't yeah, yeah. been that. And this Tennessee team makes college baseball appointment television because you don't know what you're gonna see. <laughs> Literally, you might see, you might see a walk off grand slam and a crazy bat flip in an insane environment at, at Tennessee. You might see Tony Vitello get tossed out of the game. You might see a skirmish over, over a, you know, what Vanderbilt thinks is a loaded bat. And you know that you're going to see an exciting offense and great pitchers. And they're just putting, they're not only putting a great product on the field in the sense that they win, they're putting an entertaining product on the field. And it's good for college baseball in a general sense to have this villain. And I'm so happy to play that there is nothing I've ever wanted more being a Tennessee fan than, than to be what we can be with this baseball team right now. I love it so much where you can pump your chest out and you can go, if you don't like it, how about you beat us? And cause that's the most fun thing to say. It's like with Alabama where we all complain. Oh, it's so annoying that Alabama football is so good. Always Saban just beats us all down. And an Alabama fan can look at you and go, well, you don't like it. How about you beat us? How about you just come and take it? Because until then, we're gonna be this good, and and it just it is. It's it's tough, <laughs> tough titties, I guess. That's as my <laughs> as my grit, and I don't know my friends from high school would say. Um, but I I love that man. It's so so fun having a blast. Even even with this couple of losses, we're having a blast. Yeah, it's it's such a fun team and such a fun environment that I really hope it extends to the rest of Tennessee athletics. And you're starting to see a little bit. I mean, you saw the Lady Vols softball team. I don't know if you saw that this this uh, weekend where they yeah. brought out the home run coat. Because that was part of it, right? That They, that they umpire banned told the that, home run coat. Yes, which I don't yeah. understand how you can do. Maybe bringing it out on the field. But if it's in the dugout, I don't, I don't feel like you can do that. Maybe college baseball has some strange rules. I don't know. But that seems incredibly frivolous to, to be concerned about that. But you're you're seeing the things extend to the other other Tennessee sports. You saw Euros Plavsic at the game uh, on uh, Sunday with with the fur coat, I believe. Really having a lot of fun with it. I hope this this kind of attitude, this culture, extends to the football team too. Because can you imagine if the Tennessee football team kind of becomes this villain where they're starting to play better? You're you're good. You're winning nine ten games a year. You're playing with some swagger. Opponents are talking about you because that's 
like that's the telltale sign, right? You saw these Arkansas baseball players talking about that team over in the SEC East this weekend and knocking them off, like not calling them by name. Once you start getting that kind of uh, reaction from your opponents, like you've won, you've won the battle. I mean, you are in their head at that point. They're thinking about you, and that's what you want. That's kind of what Tony Vitello was talking about. Like you don't want them looking past you. You, you don't want them thinking easy win. You want them thinking that way about you. So I hope – I hope the Tennessee football team kind of embraces the same. Like Josh Heupel's not quite the as brash as Tony Vitello, but he had some moments last year. Like there were some, yeah, there were some good moments where we saw him in the referee's face. I, w- I wouldn't uh, recommend bumping any officials, SEC officials, because uh, a suspension in football is way worse than it is in baseball, where you, you kind of need your your offensive play caller, which Josh Heupel is out there on the field. Hey, bring the fur coat on the sidelines. Make it the turnover coat or something like that. Like that could be Tennessee's thing. It kind of already is, but if you can make that extend to the football program and really just kind of change the way the football program's viewed nationally, because when if something's fun, uh, these national guys that have been hating on Tennessee, they're kind of gonna have some fun with it too. Because it look yeah. it, it it it's you start writing about Tennessee football, and if it's moving the needle they do it kind of now in a negative way because it moves the needle. If positive things start happening, I think you'll see a lot more positive attention on Tennessee football. Like we've seen Tennessee baseball because nobody, none none of the national media is like really hating on Tony Vitello for what happened. I mean, they're, uh, they don't seem, I mean, every, because everybody agrees, like you can't do it, but Hey, that that guy's a jerk. So he deserved it. Kind of. Yeah. The team just commands respect while you can also hate them. Yeah. You have to win. I mean, you have to, you have win, to win to get to that point. Like, you can't exactly. go out there and be five and seven and play that way if you're a football team. And if you're a baseball team and you're getting, you know, you're you're at 500, it doesn't hit quite the same. Yeah. The, that's, that's the thing. I, although I, I don't think – that for the football team to make a splash like that, I, I don't think that you would have to be as dominant as this baseball team is getting. I mean, that no, just nine, 10 games a year. I mean, just what we saw yes. last year, but you know, close out the old miss game, beat be truly Pittsburgh, beat Purdue, you know, finish with 10 and three, which is really what they could have been last year. If things would have went, you know, if, 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 if that passing against Ole Miss is caught, if Hendon Hooker starts the Pittsburgh game, if the bad call at the end of the Purdue game with the touchdown, if that's called the correct way, Tennessee's ten and three, and that 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 can work with that that kind of record. Exactly, because if I think the things that would need to happen to get to the point where you could bring a decent amount of that back, where specifically you could get the Tennessee fan base to a a point much closer to where it is with baseball right now would be, you got to get over the Florida hump. That's Mm -hmm. honestly, to me, that is like numero uno. You cannot have a team that just hangs over your head because they have that bragging right over you in that, that case where they can just go like, what we beat you, you know, 11 out of the last 12 or whatever it is. And that they can always just say that you have to get that off your back with this coaching change at Florida it is time to capitalize on that. You, the talent is extremely similar, if not the fact that Tennessee might have better talent, especially at some positions that really matter. And you have to get over that to start. And it has and to be should, more. It has to be more than just beating Florida once. Like 2016, yes, we saw that wasn't three, enough. four years in a row. Because like, you got to look at like uh, Vanderbilt had some success against Tennessee there for a few years. Nobody's saying, you know, Vanderbilt's not going to be talking trash to Tennessee anytime soon because they can't consistently do it. So Tennessee's got to consistently start beating Florida. Uh, you, exactly. you, Florida's going to get theirs. They're going to win some games. They're going to get some talent. They're going to have better years in Tennessee moving forward. They're always going to be a thorn in Tennessee's side. Like, so is Georgia, just like Alabama, Auburn, and LSU. But you've got to start winning your fair share of those matchups. It will never not be extremely hard to win in the swamp. That's just right. always going to be the case. But if you could go and win every single one in Neyland Stadium and start there, maybe make, make it a that. huge deal. Like it needs to be yes. when Florida beats Tennessee, it's a it's like leading sports center that night. Like it needs to be a big deal when that happens. Yes. And yes, yeah, start 
start there because you just th that mentality can change pretty quickly. You look, we even talked about this a few weeks ago. The way that Kentucky fans approach Tennessee basketball now, it's different because they know they can't beat you every time out. Like it's not, it's not some superiority complex that they're able to have where they go, oh, it's yeah, Tennessee's annoying, but we win most of the time. No, you're 10 and seven in the last 17 matchups or whatever it is with Rick Barnes. And, and you beat them the last two times out. They don't have that talking point anymore. And it, and it shows their fans are a lot more contrite <laughs> when Tennessee beats them now. And they're kind of like, eh, Tennessee's good. They beat us. They're like, they have a good basketball team. Get there with Florida. I think that's a start. You can't that have the most important because yeah, I don't, you I just like can't have that. That's the most painful loss. Like you lose to Alabama. Of course, it's awful. Even, even before the Nick Saban era, uh, and you lose to Georgia. You've had a little more success against Georgia over the years than you have Florida. It's just something about Florida. There's something about the, the fans, the, the, blue and the orange that just doesn't sit right the swamp and i don't know it, it's it's just different with them it feels like i mean ultimately the only thing standing in your way from having the georgia game be the decider for the sec east essentially every year is florida yeah that's it kentucky would like to think that they can be that they can't be no. even last year actually it it turned out the georgia game would have decided the SEC East if I'm thinking correctly. Would it have? Did Kentucky finish? I don't know how Kentucky finished. Um, but well, Tennessee, Tennessee was what five and three in the SEC last year. Yeah, so I think we might have the same record as Kentucky in the SEC. I don't. I don't totally remember. Kentucky beat Florida, so that. Yeah, helped. that that was and the they, difference. And I think they beat LSU, didn't they? Or did LSU beat them? I can't remember. So maybe Kentucky would have would have been in that slot but Tennessee had the head head to head against Kentucky I don't you know bottom line there um but you were right on the, the doorstep of that last year if you I do believe this would be correct if you would have beaten Florida the Georgia game would have been for the SEC East you can't handle Georgia's talent right now not almost no one can clearly they won the national title but Florida is really the only thing standing in your way you can consistently beat Kentucky South Carolina Missouri, we all know that that can happen. You just did it all. Oh, uh, Tennessee lost to Ole Miss. They were four and four. I, I forgot. Oh yeah, okay. And yeah, Kentucky yeah, yeah. was five and three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but very easily could have been. But but if you if you again if you would have beaten Florida, you would have been five and three against Kentucky, held the the head to head against them, and then the SEC East would have come down in that Georgia game. Bottom line, um, and so. Well, no, because Georgia would have been, Georgia still would have been, I don't know how, no, because if you beat Georgia, but they have a better record than you in the SEC, I guess they still would have made the SEC East. Yeah, or they, 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 would have, Georgia, they would have made it, they went undefeated. Yeah, yeah, so. Yeah, so they still would have made it in. Anyway, yeah. but I think year in and year out, you put yourself in that position, and and that's where you need to be in that truly competitive position where the only person standing in your way is that number one team be number two. Georgia is so good that if you're number two, you're number two to the team that's top five in America or even number one for most of last year. Like you're, you're bumping your head up against that. And that's the reality of the sec right now. And it sucks. But if you can get back to that point, get that bravado, get a rolling. I think, Hypo would not be the same, have that same mentality where he's going to go out and beat his chest like Vitello does some. But I think Tennessee fans would almost do that for him. He has his moments. I mean, he does. there was there was a moment last year where he, I can't remember exactly what he said. It was one, I think it was the Ole Miss game where they, they called the touchdown back and he asked what the referee said and he was kind of, kind of can try with his response where he's just like, yeah, apparently, you know, they don't really look at that or something like that. Like he doesn't, he's kind of short, you know, when, when referring to the referees and was it so many times you hear the, 
well, that's out of our control and you got to just play the game and control what you can control. No, you, you know, the fans are frustrated over the referees or, or what happens, what doesn't get called, what gets called incorrectly. You want to see your head coach frustrated too. Like you want to know your head coach has got your back and is out there working the referees like Tony Vitello does yep. at baseball games. And I think Heupel does that. He's just not, his personality is not quite as big as Vitello's where, you see in these interviews that Tony Vitello does, he's so candid and down to earth. It's just like a normal conversation. And I think Josh Heupel has that in him, but we don't get to see that side of him that much. Yeah, he, he is a very down to earth guy, but he is much more prone to coach speak. Yeah. Also, Vitello did you is. did you see uh, last night Tennessee released this? It's like a six minute long video kind of a Josh Heupel's normal day. They were with him from when he leaves his house in the morning, like five something in the morning to drive into the facility, goes in, gets his coffee. He greets every player as they come into the facility about 7.15. So they're they're showing these clips and it's intercut with uh, Josh Heupel being interviewed, talking about being in the facility and being a head coach. And it was a completely different version of Heupel. Like it wasn't a press conference setting it was him just kind of just a conversation where he's talking about being the head coach at Tennessee and being excited about just watching film, uh, watching the cutups of the practice and what they need to work on. They showed him sitting in on a defensive meeting that uh, Tim Banks and Mike Eckler were leading with the linebackers and Heupel's over in the corner, uh, just kind of adding stuff here and there and just kind of how that dynamic works. It was a really great look at how – kind of how he interacts with the team on a daily basis. And it was it's just great to see him in that kind of that element like we're talking about. And I, I think, like I said, I think that's in him. I just don't think we get to see it as much. I would like to see that from him a little more. I think fans would really grab onto him even more so. I, I'm pretty interested to hear this Bustle with the Boys interview with him. Yeah, because that I, has the potential. Because that's his, that's his vibe, right? Like when we talked to Ramon Foster and he talked about – how hype, how down to earth Hypel is, and how he's just one of the guys because he was, he was them. I mean, he was a national championship winning quarterback at a big time school at Oklahoma. He spent some time in the NFL. He's been on coaching staffs with Bob Stoops. He's been in the SEC before uh, this year. I mean, he's he's been on a big stage before. This isn't like with Butch Jones where it was so big for him that he didn't really know how to handle it. Or even Jeremy Pruitt, where, yeah, you kind of got there because you were on Nick Saban's staff and you were kind of set up for success and you didn't really have to do anything on your own. You weren't some great college football player. You transferred to Alabama kind of as a walk-on and you were on the field a little bit, but it wasn't the same kind of situation as what Heupel's experienced in his career. Yeah. Hopefully more of that personality will will come out because – I think it it shows so much with the baseball team how much Tennessee fans will embrace that if you give it to them. Mm-hmm. We love it so much. You you know, it's kind of that we we want somebody who's one of us. Come down, be a man of, of the people. And I think he is, obviously, to a much, much larger extent. I've Pruitt Pruitt was a man of Alabama. I mean, he wanted he really never wanted to be at Tennessee, and I'll i I'll stick by that. For, forever, he I mean, he, I, he well, he, he it, couldn't but. turn it down. I mean, he couldn't turn it yeah. down. But he he I'm, wanted to still be at Alabama. He wanted Tennessee to be Alabama. It was never going to be, and he never really wanted to be here anyway. But show the hilarious thing now about Pruitt is that he really can't go back to Alabama, at least not right now, because of the no. investigation. He's like he's not hireable in college football. So a Tennessee fans should at least if if you still can't stand Jeremy Pruitt, and I know a lot of people can't. Hang your hat on that. He can't go back to Alabama right now. He could go back to Hoover High School. You know, he could be in yeah. town. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, or how, wherever Hoover is. Uh, it's Birmingham-ish. Um, you know, he could be around. But other than that, <laughs> yeah, not much of a shot for him back in college football, at least for a while. No. Um, but I I think Hypo, I'm sure that he realizes that. It just may not be the guy that he is as much. Vitello is so naturally his image. He's not putting, he's thankfully it just the way that he is, is that he, I don't think he's putting anything on. Well, he's to be this man of the people guy that he's become. He's I feel yeah, like, like I, you I said, might have to put on a little bit of that. If he were to do that. 
Well, as you kind of said it there, the, he's become that. I mean, he, he's grown into this. He's been at Tennessee for since 2017. Like, we weren't having the same conversation a few years ago about Tony Vitello. So he's That's kind true. of yeah. he's kind of grown into this. And maybe Josh Heupel will get more comfortable and will kind of grow into this because the media attention at Tennessee is not something unless you come from an NFL team or another big time SEC program. Even though he was at Missouri, even though he's at Oklahoma, uh, being the head coach at UCF, it, it's different. Being the head coach at Tennessee, the media attention that is put on you almost every single day of the year, even when you're not in the public eye, you're still being talked about by people like us. That's something you have to get used to and kind of learn how to navigate. So maybe like we know he has a, a good personality. He, he's a funny guy at times. Like maybe we'll see more of that from him in the coming years. Maybe. Uh, I I want it to happen because it if baseball shows us anything, like how powerful this fan base can be. We we spoke a lot about it last week in terms of recruiting, you know, the Mike Honcho thing and selling Honcho t shirts and how crazy all that was and just how supportive Tennessee fans can be when they're when there's a call to action and things like that. But also just getting back to being feared would just be so huge. Because you you think back to Neyland in the late 90s, early 2000s. It was a scary place to come play football. It was a scary place for like an opposing fan to come and just watch a game. <laughs> I don't know if I want that. There was some wild stuff between SEC teams back then. Still very much is. For sure. I, you know, I, I don't want people getting in fights or anything like that uh, or throwing stuff uh, at at people unless it's, you know, unless they deserve it. But <laughs> uh, go back to it being an intimidating place to play where, like Tennessee baseball, again, you have LSU's head coach going out and being, what did he say? Last year, uh, after call, it, call the the team and the fans and stuff nasty. Yeah, nasty. Be nasty. I want ne I want Neilan nasty Neilan. You know, give back to how this used to be. But you got to give us a reason. You got to get back. And it it really you know I say like my again got back really late last night. Brain's not working at a hundred hundred percent. I said I guess we were saying there you would be banging your head up against Georgia for the SEC East. But realistically, if Georgia is going to continue to go undefeated in the SEC East, which for the foreseeable future seems like it'll probably be the case, unless there's just some miracle game from Kentucky, some miracle game from Auburn, some, you know, something where they're able to beat them. You're going to have to beat Alabama too. Uh, and I guess I wasn't thinking about that um, to, to get there. Because in yeah, in years past, before Georgia got as good as they were, you could rely on Georgia to lose a game, to lose two mm -hmm. games, and so as long as you you won your part, you could afford that Alabama loss and still be right there for the SEC East. But if you're gonna if they're gonna go undefeated and you're gonna lose two games uh, in the SEC, I mean that's that's not gonna work. I don't think Georgia is gonna go undefeated every single year. I mean they probably not. They had a lot of talent this past year. They're going to have a lot of talent in 2022, but they've lost a lot of talent from 2021. I think that's what made that team so special defensively. It's just the amount of like elite talent that worked out, like five-star talent that came that wasn't a bust. There was, they, they all delivered on the hype, and that doesn't always happen. Uh, th that's why I don't. I don't think what George is doing is sustainable just because of Kirby Smart and the offense. I don't think that you're going to see that from them every year. Obviously, they're going to be really good, but I think, I think like the 2018, 2019 versions of Georgia, where they're really good, but maybe they come up short of the college playoff, and and maybe they leave the door open for another team in the SEC East to come in there. I think that's more the reality of Georgia. Yeah, hopefully it is not sustainable, and hopefully, as we've talked about in in weeks past, this NIL stuff kind of yeah. shifts those tectonic plates around plus the transfer portal where you're you yep. know you're losing some of those five-star guys that aren't Absolutely. seeing the field early you five-star freshmen want to play now they don't want to wait 
Yeah, and so hopefully that can shift some of those things around where Tennessee gets a Nico and then builds a huge class around him and then gets some guys out of the transfer portal. Which and there, then, I should mention real quick, uh, apparently we are extremely good luck because Tennessee's got another commitment while we've been recording this. The top player in the state of Tennessee, Caleb Herring, committed to Tennessee this morning. Edge rusher. All right. Num- number six edge rusher in the nation. Apparently, it doesn't matter what day we record on. We bring them good luck as far as recruiting. So you're welcome, Tennessee fans. You're welcome, Josh Heupel. Here's the key. Just for the the rest of this offseason, we just kind of – we're going to have to record for a really long time, Zach. We got to make sure <laughs> – we have to ensure a good recruiting class. So we're going to have to record like you know six, seven hours a day. Make sure that we get as many guys in the fold as possible. Um, that's huge, a de- specifically a defensive player – and in state, because there was a lot to be said about how how Tennessee has kind of lost its grip on the state of Tennessee recruiting wise, um, and and Tennessee historically not a state that's just an absolute breeding ground for the best talent in America, but I I, I think getting back to getting the number one player in the state. I mean, if you are Tennessee in the, And this kid is in the state of Tennessee, and he is, you said, the number six, number six edge rusher? Number six edge rusher, number one player in the state. In the state state of Tennessee. Number 50 overall recruit. So he's not like, he's he's on the outside of being a five-star. He's not far from it. Not not quote-unquote elite or blue chip or whatever, but is like right there. Which to um, me, like you, you got to get the top 100 guys because you could take exactly a number 50 guy could easily be a five star, a number 20 guy could easily be a four star. Like those rankings are almost interchangeable in those in that range. Yeah, and and if that kid is going to be in in the state that you are in, you have to at a minimum you have to be in the running with those guys in in a very real way, be in the final three and miss out to you know whoever like. Don't love that, but it's at least understandable. But some of the stuff that's happened in the past where it was like Tennessee wasn't even in contention. It didn't yeah. even matter. That's unacceptable. It cannot happen. And and now you get the number one kid from the state of Tennessee, maybe sets a precedent, precedent for the rest of the kids uh, in the state of Tennessee to kind of say like, hey, there's something going on here. You know, we, we're trying to build something special at Tennessee and kind of get that ball rolling. Because you did, you did also over the weekend – Lose out on on uh, Kyler of uh, uh, Casper, Ka- yeah, Kyler Casper committed to Oregon, which I found kind of interesting. Um, I mean, maybe just some got some fat nil deal that was just sweet enough, decided to pull the trigger, whatever it might have been. Um, but you still have Carnell Tate out there floating. You know, you know, not sure exactly how he's leaning, but there are still some other guys that specifically Nico Yalmaliava has had a. Uh, has had an impact on that could still come to Tennessee. But this, to see a kid who's a special defensive player, look at what Heupel is running and and decide to come to Tennessee. I That's huge. I, yeah, I, I, think, I really, that's meaningful. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of credit, not just to Josh Heupel, but to Tim Banks too. Because like you said, yeah. You got to want to play in this defense. Like, uh, Heupel's going to be able to recruit the offensive guys, and he's going to be able to do most of the heavy lifting on stuff like that. And the culture, the head coach is very important when it comes to defense, even if they're offensive minded. But you're ultimately your relationship is with Tim Banks, your relationships with your position coach, uh, Rodney Garner, you know, defensive line coach, Mike Eckler, your linebackers coach. Those are the guys that, that have to lead the charge on something like this and and they did their job like you got the guy it's kind of reminiscent of 2013 2014 with butch jones where he really started building some momentum and getting these top in-state guys and that's how those 2015 and 2016 teams those are the guys that were kind of carrying the load there jalen hurd Derek barnett those in-state guys jalen reeves maben and that's why those teams are so good because you've got those guys to stay at home. And then you, uh, Josh Malone, another one, you got you, you paired them with guys like Josh Dobbs. That's the way you got to build a program at Tennessee. Butch Jones blew it. Uh, they kind of had to start over with Pruitt. He never really was able to, to make, you know, a lot of headway with the in state guys. 
But now we're seeing Josh Heupel kind of at that point that Butch Jones was at where he's really a little bit ahead of Butch as, as far as, you know, on-field success. But Tennessee's going to have another shot here to, to build from the in-state talent uh, base that, that Tennessee has, adding some guys like Nico from outside the state. You're going to have a chance here to build something special again, and hopefully Josh Heupel won't blow it. I don't think he'll blow it. He's a much better head coach than, than Butch Jones ever was because he he knows football better than Butch did. But you've got another shot here, and that's exciting to me because I, I always – and we've talked about it before. Like, you you do the what-ifs with 2015 and 2016, like how good those Tennessee teams could have been with good coaching. We're, we're fixing to go down that road again, it feels like. Had a, had a conversation – with uh, I think I actually mentioned this in weeks past uh, too, had a conversation with a high school coach, totally by chance ended up sitting beside him at a thing I was at um, high school coach in the state of Tennessee who, who coached some guys who have played at Tennessee in recent years. And he said of Pruitt, he said like, you know, Butch, Butch was a used car salesman, but wasn't, wasn't super offensive. You know, you, you could just see through who he was and just go, okay, we get your sales pitch. It's pretty typical coach stuff for a lot of guys. Um, but that Pruitt was just terrible. Like he just was a tyrant and, and, you know, really this guy just did not have good stuff to say, uh, about Pruitt. And I think that if you asked across the state for guys that coach at schools that Tennessee draws from for talent. I think you would hear something similar. I think he really did some damage. Pruitt did some damage to recruiting relationships in the state of Tennessee for UT. And, and I think, you know, th those coaches realize Hypel, it's a totally new regime and you can kind of just start over fresh, but the, the damage is, still is done. there. Yeah. The stigma yeah. is there. The damage is still done. And you're already fighting against the fact that just Tennessee has been a, a, bruised and battered brand for the last 15 years and you're you're coming up on kids <sighs> this pains me to say you're coming up on kids who if they're 18 right now they were born in 2004 2004 like that's almost the the first bad season for Tennessee at the beginning the kind of the genesis of this terrible era was 2006 or 2005 was, 05 two, oh yeah that, that's that's right it, and whatever that 5 and 7 season was mm -hmm. where it took a turn and then and then you went to the SEC championship the next year and then another 5 and 7 season you're coming up on on where the only thing that these kids have known is Tennessee being bad and you're fighting against that that whole perception of like, they don't know Tennessee is a power brand. I went, God, this, this is so just to, to make you feel old. Um, in New York city, I went to the nine 11 Memorial museum this past weekend. And it, there was a kid behind us who I think he was still a teenager, probably like 15, 16. And his dad was explaining what nine 11 was. And of course guys that are our age, it's, it was the most meaningful event of our childhood. I base like all of my timelines around when nine 11 yeah. happened. I go, I go, uh, yeah, I was, I was that old when nine 11 happened. And that happened two years after nine 11, you know, it's like that impactful. Of yeah, a thing. Well, I mean, I heard it, I heard it this weekend on the plane pre and post nine 11, you know, people yeah. talking about, I mean, it, it's, it's an absolute landmark. And this dad was explaining to his son, like, what 9-11 was and i was like oh yeah they don't know yeah they weren't alive to see it and like tennessee is coming up on like these kids weren't even alive to see when tennessee was winning 11 games a year and i mean you're basically already there you are really already there where oh, i mean if you're born in 04 your your earliest memory is probably like the dully years maybe if yeah you, if if you have the, the parents kids, that were into Tennessee football, the kids that you're recruiting right now, if you start recruiting them at 15, 16, those kids were born in 06, mm. <laughs> 07. Like, ah, that you're, you have, you've gone so far from the era of greatness that that's like, that is where you are at, where they don't know what that Tennessee brand can be. So you're fighting against that. You're fighting against the way that Pruitt damaged the relationships and the recruiting pipelines and all of these things. And to see this 
this heal in some sense, actual verifiable proof that it's healing by getting the number one player in the state of Tennessee is extremely encouraging. I I love to see that. Especially um, since he's a defensive player. That is, yeah, that's what's most exciting to me because look, like Tim Banks, it, it's like, I've said it before. It's like having another head coach because of the way Josh Heupel, his background, even though he like, like I said, he's in those meetings, he spends time in those meetings and does what he's supposed to do as a head coach. And I think he enjoys it, but his heart's on the offensive side of the ball. I mean, he's usually with the quarterbacks in practice. That's where he spends most of his time. And that's good. That's, that's what he should do. That's why he's, it's part of why he's at Tennessee is because he brings that element. But if Tennessee's going to really compete with Georgia and Alabama, they're going to have to be elite on the defensive side of the ball. I mean, you can't, you're not going to win 55 to 48 every week. That you you have to be capable of winning a game 20 to 13 or, or 17 to 10 if, if that's what's necessary to, to win on a on a Saturday in November. I mean, you, you just don't know how a game is going to go. It, every game is different. You've got to have that strong defense in the SEC uh, to win games. And that that's why this – it's almost like when Nico committed. I mean, Nico is obviously bigger uh, and more exciting, but I think this is pretty close to the same excitement level on for the defense. Absolutely. Because I, <laughs> I almost had the fear – that Tennessee's defense would get so beaten up that Tim Banks might go like, okay, one year is enough. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna hop on out of here. I think I, I think I can go somewhere else where it doesn't look like my, you know, like my defense is is bad. Uh, and because, and and even even still, his defense wasn't terrible. It wasn't last in the SEC or anything like that. He, even with the way that Josh Heupel plays, so credit to him in, in so far as that goes. Um, well, they looked better just on the field. They didn't look confused. They didn't look out of sorts. Uh, the, statistically, some of Pruitt's defenses were probably better, but a lot of that was because Tennessee's offense would hold on to the ball for so long that you know you, it's not the same. Like it's not it's it's not a fair comparison because yeah. Tim Banks' defense is defending so many more possessions than Pruitt's was. So that that scoring. Uh, scoring defense stat where you're giving up this many points a game, it, it, you can't look at that. Even the yards per game is not accurate. You got to look at stuff like third down. How, how do you uh, fare on third downs, fourth down, stuff like that? Absolutely. And he, he's done an admirable job with what he has to work with. I, I would be very excited to see what he can do with a heightened level of talent. Yes, because they were very thin last year. They're going to be thin yeah. this year. Uh, but... You you They're are getting, getting I mean you're better. still going to be in a rough spot this coming season a pretty similar spot frankly unless they just get a bunch of transfers in the door at the last minute but uh, I I'm excited to see what they could do given actual talent because I think you look at how many points Hypel can put up if you could make the defense just serviceable where they only give up points every fourth possession <laughs> you know something like that. Uh, and and don't don't have every game be like the Kentucky game where they have to face ninety nine snaps, you know, something mm. just crazy. Um, you part know, of that's turnovers, like you gotta you gotta yeah, guy like Caleb Herring can get after their quarterback, force a fumble, uh, get your defense off the field. You gotta have more of that. Gotta be disruptive, and yes. so hopefully they they can bring in some dudes that can be that or or coach up the guys that they have to be that and we'll see how how that goes but that's that's exciting another another week where we get a huge commit we speak it into existence um it wasn't now, as cool as Car the last one yeah if carnell tate commits yeah can, we, can we talk about it wouldn't that be crazy if carnell tate committed during our podcast wouldn't that be wouldn't that be crazy yeah hello carnell so <laughs> Plan it on a Monday or on a Monday. Uh, yes. Coming uh, up and that'll work. Yes, it would be perfect. So there, there's if that. that happens, we need to get some of this NIL kit back. Yeah, that's true. Clearly. Hey, hey, Tennessee, hook your boys up. I'm I'm wearing a I'm wearing a I'm I'm in support. I'm wearing a Kennedy Chandler NIL t shirt right now. Oh yeah, there you uh, go. The Chef Ken. Um if you if you want to see it, go to the YouTube, a to z sports.com 
uh, or a, a to Z sports, type that into YouTube uh, and subscribe to the channel. But you can see my uh, my Kennedy shirt. Um, I got it right before he declared for the you know, NBA. Um, I, I'm sorry. That was my fault. I shouldn't have bought the shirt. I get, I encouraged him too much. I wanted him to come would back. You, would you still have bought it if, uh, if it was post draft announcement? I might, I might've gone. It was also a little before baseball truly took off. Like, mm. I think it was m- maybe after the Ole Miss series, but before, you know, you swept three series in a row and it was clear that Tennessee is like absolutely elite. I might have gone with a baseball NIL shirt. I probably still will. Um, I need to get a honcho shirt. Um, been dragging my feet. But uh, yeah, it's uh, pro- probably not, but it's not for all love to Kennedy. Uh, it's just because baseball was a little more relevant at the time. But um all, nonetheless, I do love the shirt. And so youtube.com type in A to Z and you can see it there. I, I did. I think people really liked last week the showing video clips. So maybe we can do more of that. Showed video clips of Nico last week uh, on the show of him throwing at the event in Knoxville. So maybe we can do more of that Two, um Oh, we'll finish finish with this because we didn't mention it last week. Meant to mention it last week, but didn't. For Tennessee basketball, just to throw it in here at the end. Uh, Brandon Huntley Hatfield transferring away and he I think everybody it's been a while since he announced this now a a number of days but the main thing that hurts as of yesterday he announced the places that he will be going to visit and it was Louisville and SMU SMU specifically that it SMU feels like a good spot for him um because a former a Rick, a former assistant for Rick just took over that job. Um, but he's going to Auburn too. If Brandon Holly Hatfield leaves Tennessee and goes to Auburn, and then God forbid is great for Bruce Pearl, I will vomit. I please, please don't let that happen. And I'm sure Bruce, it would make his day to to stick it to Tennessee like that. Please no. Please God no. But it's such a strange situation where we kind of felt like he was coming on at the end of the year. His minutes were increasing. He played a a, was playing a bigger role for Tennessee. And then this kind of happened out of nowhere where the whispers behind the scenes were that Tennessee didn't wasn't really trying that hard to keep him in Knoxville, which I don't. I, I know there's more to the story that we don't know that that a lot of people don't know that maybe it's between him and the coaching staff and whatever, whatever conversation happened between them. It seems like Huntley Hatfield didn't really like what he heard. He didn't really like maybe what his role was going to be moving forward, which is kind of surprising because, like we said, it, it felt like he was seeing an uptick in minutes and usage and was becoming an important player for Tennessee. But th- just the fact that they didn't really push to keep him. Like what did they see that that we didn't see as far as his what he can contribute? So what I wondered is he, I think pretty clearly has NBA aspirations. His build is certainly an NBA build. He mm-hmm. he has the physicality of an NBA player. His skills are not there, and really, not all that close yet. Um, you have to have so much more finesse, especially if. If you're his size, but you're not like he's not seven foot two, like he's not a completely imposing size, you really have to be a pretty good shooter Mm -hmm. to make it in in the NBA. You got to be a hybrid, sort of Kevin Durant type, uh, Dirk Nowitzki, like that. uh, Yeah, that's the style of the NBA now. There's so many, so much perimeter shooting. Everybody can shoot, and he is just not there at all. But I think he's he's thinking NBA. He's thinking NBA. And Rick probably looked at him. This is all speculation all on my part. I have no proof of any of this at all. But I wonder if Rick looked at him and said, look, Olivier is going to come back. Olivier Kamwa will be back next year. Euros Plastic will be back next year. You were already pretty much playing over Fulky for some amount of time. Uh, but he's going to be gone. But you still got two guys in your way. And I'm not just going to give you minutes to, to play. And I wonder if he looked at that and went, I'll go somewhere else where I, I know I'll be a star. 
Because if he, you know, he goes to SMU, he's starting every game. He'll get the ball in his hands a ton. He's going to be one of the best players in that entire league in in the American League, you know. And, and maybe that's more what he's looking for—a place where he can stand out as he develops. Because at Tennessee, he's going to be pro- probably next year with with Kamon coming back would probably be not a starter, and then uh, it would really have to fight for it. And maybe that's just not not every kid has that kind of drive. To just be like, I'm going to do whatever it takes to become a starter on this team. I'll put in all the work. Sometimes they just, no, I want to be the starter and then I'll work. And it's it's an immature mindset, sure. But it's one that's, it's not one that's going to keep him from probably future being good enough to make it to the NBA, if that makes sense. Um, it maybe takes him longer than it should. Uh, again, this is total speculation. It may not be like this at all, <laughs> but, uh, but I, I could see that happening because Rick is just such a tough coach. Rick is not going to give you anything for free. He'll look you right in the eyes and be like, I don't care if, if you're Anthony Davis, if there's somebody better than you, I will play them and not you. And if you play badly, I will take you out and sit your butt on the bench. Like that's just the way that he does it. He doesn't care. And so I, I wonder if that's what happened and he just goes, I'm I'm looking for somewhere. Like one of the one of the places on his list was Louisville. He's gonna go uh and and visit Louisville. And they're really set up right now. They're in this rebuilding mode, new coach with Kenny Payne. And I, I wonder if he's thinking like huge brand in Louisville. They're in reset mode. I can go there, be their starting guy, and make a name for myself in the ACC. You know, it's a big league big school, but I can be the star on that team. I don't know. I, I, I'm i pretty interested to see where he goes. To me, if that's the case, Auburn doesn't seem like a good fit, but I guess you never know. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't... Just the just the fact that, that Barnes and the staff wasn't pushing that hard to keep him from leaving, does it? That, that makes me think that there's not a reason for huge concern here. Kind of like you alluded to, my biggest concern would be him going to Auburn and then kind of exploding and and living up to the potential, and then you got to deal with that and him and, and Bruce for a year, maybe two years. That that's worst case scenario. And who knows? I mean, that could happen. Who knows? You you never know how how it'll play out. But I don't I don't think it's knowing that aspect of it that they weren't pushing to keep him makes me feel like it's not that big of a deal. The only thing that really gives me pause is that just during his entire time at Tennessee, Rick has struggled to find good big men. He found Grant Williams, and that was a miracle. And, you know, it's three-star, no-name guy who just turned out to be an All-American. <laughs> it happens yeah. sometimes. And and Rick mm-hmm. is obviously a big contributor there. He was the coach of the team. But outside of that, who else has he found is a great big man? He helped Kyle Alexander improve, but Kyle Alexander was never great. And especially in the last few years, they have truly struggled to find a, a real presence down low. And so I, I definitely do look at the situation and go, you better have a plan. I, I don't know exactly what you're thinking, but Olivier Kamwa, he's, he was getting better, but he's going to be coming off an injury. Euros Plavsic, I don't think will ever be that guy, even though he's he is a fun enforcer and he he brings great energy to the team. But he's not ever, I don't think, going to be a go-to guy where you dump it down in the paint. And you go, we need points. Give it to Euros. He's never going to be that guy. And and so I I hope you have a plan. I, I'm not sure. And uh, Hanjay Tamba is also transferring um, after he set out this season. And so you're, you're losing him. Where are you going? What are you doing, Rick? Is, is there somebody in the in the pipeline, trans, in the transfer portal that they're looking at so i'm i'm interested to see where they go or if he just thinks that the guys that he has are are going to be uh adequate enough i don't i don't remember everybody that came in in this recruiting class if there's another big man in the wings i mean tomba was kind of there although i don't know how much he was ever really going to play um i we'll see it it but i i think it you have to mention it and just go, Rick has struggled to find big men. And uh, it's been a weakness of his uh, during his time at Tennessee. So 
It's probably not going to change unless you just get lucky again, like with Grant Williams. Yeah. Uh, I think we just have to accept that, to be honest. I mean, he is what I mean, we said it before, and it, it extends not just to the NCAA tournament, but how he recruits as well. I think it, it just is what it is. They do have uh, a setup with a guy. Let me see. It's coming from St. Louis, Yuri Collins. Tennessee is the favorite to land this kid. He's point guard. Um, so no, not a big guy, but Tennessee is the favorite to land him. This kid averages, I if I'm remembering correctly, nine assists a game. So that uh, eight assists per game, eight assists per game, sorry. But only one assist less. So eight <laughs> assists per game and 11 points. That would be good. Especially you get, you get Santi back. He had Edwards coming in, who hopefully will be a solid shooter. Um, I think think you're gonna have a pretty dang good backcourt with a kid that can give you eight assists a game. So that would be a nice addition. But still, <laughs> are we just relying on who, who's who's playing in the paint? Who is gonna bring bring that presence, rebound the basketball? Your Euros is great, but again, he's just not that go-to guy. Where are we going? What are we doing? So we'll see. I think that's it. Any anything else for the good folks at home, Zach, that we might have missed that you want to mention? I think that about covers it. We'll uh, we'll try to time up Carnell Tate's commitment and uh, keep an yes. eye out for that. And see see what we can do. Uh, we'll do Mid- we'll do our part. Midday lunchtime on on some coming Monday, we'll try. We'll talk to Carnell and see if we can get him. <laughs> we'll make sure that we coordinate so that it happens in the middle of the show uh, again. Um. All right. I am Charlie Burris. That is Zach Reagan. Thank you so much to everybody who, who listens. The The last episode was huge. I think I gave it a really nice thumbnail on YouTube. A real, It was a real banger of a thumbnail. A lot of people watched. A lot of new people watched. So that's exciting. If you're a new listener, welcome. Uh, we, have, we have a good time here on the whole show. But that's the big orange podcast. Oh, I'm playing the wrong song. Here it is. Now we're right. At Charlie underscore Burris, at Zach TNT, at A to Z Sports, A to Z Sports.com, the A to Z Sports Podcast Network feed. Subscribe, 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 rate, review, maybe. And then YouTube, go there, watch the show, see the shirt that I have on if you want to, and the video clips of Nico if you watch last week's episode. Um, and, and you'll get more visuals and video clips in the future if you do subscribe and you see the show there. I think that's it. Thanks for listening. Everybody have a great week, and we'll talk to y'all next week. See you guys later.